The next item of business is a debate on motion 8855 in the name of Keith Brown on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now and I call on Keith Brown to speak to and to move the motion in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we are, as you know, a nation which is very proud of its military history, and it's particularly timely to reflect on that history now as the period of remembrance has just drawn to a close. And many members here, and certainly Scottish ministers, have been proud to play our part in these commemorations, honouring the memory of those who have fallen. But it's equally important to recognise the contribution of those who are still serving and those who have left or are leaving the armed forces and settling in Scotland. The Scottish Government remains fully committed to supporting all of our armed forces community, whether serving or retired. And we do this in the context of a changing military landscape in Scotland. Just over a year ago, the Ministry of Defence announced a series of devastating closures to military bases across Scotland, cutting the defence estate by almost 20%. The MOD has still not confirmed the full detail of these changes or what the impact will be on local communities. This is wholly unacceptable, particularly amongst continued speculation about the latest UK Government Capability Review due to report later this year. So for my part, I will continue to press the UK Government to reverse the ill-thought-through basing changes. And just to give an example of why they're ill-thought-through, one will suffice. Uh, Glencourse Barracks uh, in Pennycook, £60 million spent on it as recently as a few years ago, now scheduled for closure. As I say, these are extremely ill-thought-out changes. And we also will ask the UK Government to reveal the full impact of those plans. But where it falls to our devolved responsibilities, the Scottish Government continues to work to ensure that no disadvantage is experienced as a result of military service. In 2016, we published Renewing Our Commitments, which set out how we were supporting veterans in Scotland. Since then, we've continued to work collaboratively with our partners in the public, private and third sectors to deliver support where it's needed the most. And I've committed to update Parliament's annually on progress. The Scottish Government has therefore today published Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland, which outlines the work and train across the Scottish Government, focusing on our priorities and our response, of course, to the work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, Eric Fraser. And I'd like to take this opportunity to commend Eric Fraser on his reports. Scotland continues to lead the way with the only Veterans Commissioner in the UK. And over the past three years, the Commissioner's work has continued to help drive our policy development. We're there for us to take forward. The Scottish Government has responded positively to all recommendations across the Commissioner's reports on transition, on housing, employability, skills and learning. On housing and transition, the Veterans Commissioner highlighted issues experienced by some veterans in accessing information. In response, the Scottish Government has launched a veterans portal to bring together information on housing, health, jobs, education and veteran support services, as well as links to other key websites. The dedicated housing section clearly sets out options and advice, but we've also written to all social landlords asking for them to share their practice on supporting service leavers and veterans with us. And we will use that information to help promote good practice across the social housing sector. And that will help inform our revision of the guidance on social housing allocations. I've mentioned before in debates in this chamber that it's still the case that too many of our armed forces personnel are unaware of that during the course of their service, they are able to accumulate points towards uh, council housing, for example. So both the revised guidance for landlords and our housing guide for people leaving the armed forces and ex-service personnel will be relaunched in 2018. We continue, of course, to provide housing support through funding to organisations such as the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association and by supporting priority access to schemes which encourage home ownership to members of the armed forces and veterans. On employability and skills, this remains a key focus for us going forward. We continue to work with our partners to support veterans into employment. So Skills Development Scotland, Job Centre Plus, and the Career Transition Partnership work hard to ensure those leaving the armed forces know about the training and the work placement opportunities that can help them start the next chapter of their career. For example, Skills Development Scotland's webpage, My World of Work, continues to be an excellent resource for all of the veterans and the families seeking information about future opportunities. 
and programmes such as Community Jobs Scotland also give veterans a chance to experience civilian jobs. We have also worked with employers and partners to publish a best practice toolkit, capitalising on military talent to help employers understand more about the skills that veterans have to offer. We have also expanded the Scottish Veterans Fund in partnership with Standard Life Aberdeen to include a specific strand on employment. That fund has now given over £1 million since 2008 to support projects and organisations in Scotland. And a core recommendation of the Veterans Commissioner was the need for increased strategic direction. And I'm very pleased that a strategic group on veterans' employability, chaired by Mark Bibby of Poppy Scotland, has been established. Uh, this group has influenced real change in how our public sector agencies work together to support veterans in Scotland. They are also taking opportunities to talk to employers about how they can provide and promote further job opportunities for veterans. Now, all this is very good, it's positive, but we know that there's more can be done. So we will be using Apprenticeship Week to promote opportunities to veterans and those considering leaving the armed forces in particular, uh, not least through graduate level apprenticeships, which are fully funded and open to people of all ages. And in partnership with Skills Development Scotland, we will develop a welcome page for veterans on the previously mentioned website, My World of Work. That will link into other key web resources, such as the Veterans Gateway, and will also simplify accessing careers and employability information and advice. I believe that in addition to these measures, we should also explore what other opportunities there are to support veterans and their families to access quality jobs, and importantly, talking about families as well is extremely important in this regard. Uh, to that end, I've asked the Strategic Group on Veterans Employability to work with the Ministry of Defence, the Career Transition Partnership, Skills Development Scotland, and other delivery bodies in Scotland to make recommendations on what further support is needed to help veterans move into good quality, sustainable jobs. This is a very important matter, very important to veterans, and I look forward to engaging with the group over the next few months. Alongside this focus support, and since April this year, we've committed £5 million to ensure that veterans in receipt of social care in Scotland receive the full value of their war pensions. This is a substantial investment in the welfare of veterans and provides them with equity. Back to the point which I made previously, which we've previously agreed with veterans organisations, our aim should be to make sure there's no disadvantage to people from having served in the military. And the idea that their war pensions should be subsumed uh, in relation to uh, payments for social care is wrong. And that's why we have taken this measure. Healthcare has remained a continuing priority through the work of the Armed Forces and Veterans Health Joint Group. And we continue to work with the MOD and other stakeholders on spe specific issues such as streamlining the transfer of military health records. I have to say that has become quite frustrating and I would hope they would have made more progress with the MOD by now. On mental health, we've highlighted Scottish Government support for veterans within our mental health strategy and have also partnered with local NHS boards and integrated joint boards to offer funding totalling £825,000 in 2017-18 to support the continuing Veterans First Point network. In recognising the importance of supporting the whole family, we also continue to work through the Scottish Service Children's Strategy Group to guide and engage work around supporting the educational needs of children from armed forces families in Scotland. And members here, especially those with military experience, will know of the particular stresses and strains that can be caused to military families and children from being moved on a regular basis. I will do. Mike Rumbles. First, Pine Centres, uh, does he have any comment to make on the closure in Grampian of the First Pine Centre because of lack of funding that's available? Yes. I'm not sure from the nature of the question if Mike Rumbles is aware of the, how Veterans First Point was uh, first established. It was established through the Westminster government providing money through the LIBOR funding. Uh, and it was assumed that it would become mainstreamed and it would become part of mainstream health services. And that's happening in many, many areas, even if the original... Um, the concept with the money provided by LIBOR has now been exhausted. The lessons from it have been learned. In recognising the importance of supporting the whole family, we continue to work through, uh, as I've mentioned, the Scottish Service Children's Strategy Group, but we're also seeking to work within the justice system to support those veterans who are in contact with the prison system or the police. So across all of our responsibilities, we will therefore continue to seek to improve our service provision for the armed forces community, especially the small but significant number who struggle to access those services. 
However, it's worth pointing out, and I'd want to do this at every opportunity in talking about veterans, to mention the fact that in the vast majority of cases, our veterans are an extremely valuable asset to the civilian workplace and our communities with transferable skills and attributes, sometimes skills and attributes that they themselves are not particularly conscious of or willing to promote, which they should do. Uh, and they've been gained throughout a military career. So my ambition therefore remains to make Scotland the destination of choice for service leavers through offering high living standards, access to housing, good quality, sustainable jobs and opportunities for skills development. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now ask Maurice Curry to open for the Conservatives and to move the motion in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Firstly, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing forward this debate today. It is right, uh, and in particular at this time of year, that we pay tribute uh, to the important part that the armed forces and veterans community plays in Scottish life. We in the Scottish Conservatives look forward to supporting his motion today. I am glad that the Government has rightly taken the chance to pay tribute to the sterling work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner Eric Fraser and his team. On a personal note, as convener, I would like to thank Eric Fraser for his engagement with the cross-party group of the Armed Forces and Veterans Community, of which I am convener. His contribution to the work and debate of the group has made me most welcome, and I hope he has gained something from those gatherings as well. All the Veterans Commissioner's reports on transition, housing, and employability skills and learning have set ambitious, ambitious recommendations, and there are many of them. Uh, produced useful information and given us all those in the wider armed forces and veterans community plenty of food for thought which has sparked productive and insightful debate. In his transition report he correctly identifies, that this, that, uh, identifies this as a critical stage for those leaving the armed forces and the chance to have a detailed look at the Sc Scottish perspective is welcome. His recommendations surrounding the need for more joined-up working between UK government, Scottish government and local authorities in supporting those leaving the armed forces hits the nail bang on the head. I think as, as, all, I think as all in this parliament would recognise and support, helping veterans isn't a party political issue or somewhere for conflict to arise between different levels of government, but it is something we need to come together on and get right for every veteran in Scotland. In the housing report, Eric Fraser, he corre Eric Fraser correctly identified the issue surrounding the need for better information for veterans and again highlighting the need for work between the Scottish Government, the UK Government as well, to ensure that advice and MOD briefings reflect housing policy and provision in Scotland so service leavers choosing to settle in Scotland are not disadvantaged. Also, it was encouraging that Eric Fraser took the opportunity to highlight the importance of the Armed Forces Covenant by advocating the need for local authorities to provide more guidance and information to their frontline staff on the principles of the Covenant and the Council's policy on housing support for veterans. His third report covered what is the massively important area of employability skills and learning to which the Cabinet Secretary referred in his opening speech. Getting a veteran into a job or training can often be the best thing for helping turn around their whole life. It was thanks to Eric Fraser's recommendation that we now have a Veterans Employability Strategic Working Group under the leadership of Neil Bibby operating. I would be interested to hear from the Cabinet Secretary if he has an update on how that group is progressing. Additionally, Eric Fraser's recommendation on the need for better recognition for, of qualifications or skills that veterans possess is a very important point. The work of business in the community in this area is a very welcome step forward and I was glad to have the opportunity to host them as they launch their toolkit to support business here in the Parliament last year. It, is only, it isn't the only important in veterans event we have he, had here in Parliament during the last year, one of which was a members debate held last year on stolen value by my colleague uh, stolen, valor, sorry, stolen Valor by my colleague Liam Kerr. Sadly, the bill going through Westminster on this subject fell during the June's election uh, and no replacement has come forward so far. <clears throat> I believe the example of James Riley of Fife who lied and posed as an ex-Royal Marine and then stolen £60,000 meant to support veterans highlights the need for action in this area. 
I would be interested to hear from the Governor whether any such consideration has been given to bring forward legislation on this issue. Moving on to my amendment in my name, which I formally move, uh, I hope that this will receive the support from all sides of the Chamber. I believe it is vital to recognize the importance of many veterans' charities who support our veterans in many ways, some in very difficult circumstances. And I'm pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary state in his opening speech uh, that this was obviously going to be looked at. And I welcome that. In Scotland alone, we have at least 320 Armed Forces charities operating in the area, providing a wide variety of different services for the veterans community, such as helping provide veterans with health and well-being services and activities, education, employment and career services and in housing provision. The scale and nature of these charities, of course, differs massively. We have this large nationally recognised organisations such as Poppy Scotland and Legion Scotland, down to the smaller organisations who, who do just as valuable work, such as the numerous veterans breakfast clubs, drop-in centres, community cafes that run across the nation. One example of the massive amount of work that these charities do is the Lothian Veterans Centre in Dalkeith. They deliver over 200 hours of support sessions or activities a month supporting veterans. They have welcomed over 160 brand new clients in total so far this year in addition to the many regulars and returners and this includes a small but increasing number of partners and family members. It's three to four times up on last year. They cover a wide range of the veterans community as well as from early service leavers to those that are retired. They support veterans from all three services and from across the Lothian regions. The type of work they do is spread across just a larger area as well as supporting veterans with health and well-being advice, housing and benefit advice, supplying help with employment and training and also running a drop-in centre. The work of the drop-in centre in particular is valuable. I had the pleasure of attending one of their Friday bacon roll mornings at the centre. It was just as enjoyable as it sounds, but it did have a serious side as well as providing a safe space for veterans to talk about their issues and concerns and access the support they need. They are just one example of great locally run veterans charities and there are numerous other examples I could have highlighted from across Scotland. But groups like Lothian Veterans Centres do struggle the cost of their service is high and accessing funds can be a struggle due to the high barriers for entry for funding placed in front of them. We need to do more to support these groups and without them the cost and impact on our local authorities will be great and the negative impact upon veterans even greater. I would urge the Cabinet Secretary and Ministers as well to look at how we can support smaller veterans charities and groups what we are doing, who are doing great work and who we want to do even more work but need a bit of support. I am sure members from all sides are willing to support them in this great work. Finally, presiding officer, I would be pleased to hear from the minister summing up today on whether they will support my call to Scotland for Scotland to host the Invictus Games. I made this call previously in the chamber as I believe it will be a great success and help raise a profile of the issues facing our disabled servicemen and women and veterans. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mark Griffin to open for Labour. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate on the subject of Armed Forces Veterans, the work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, and to talk about some of the vital support services and charities that operate in Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom. I'd like to acknowledge from the outset the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in defence of our freedoms that we, had, we enjoy and to put on record the continued support that we on this side of the chamber give to our armed forces personnel and veterans in Scotland. We are committed to continuing to work on a cross-party basis to ensure that our veterans and their families receive the support that they need and deserve. And in particular, uh, we recognise that our service personnel often need help with the transition to civilian life, particularly in finding housing and employment. And we recognise that those who leave the service can be a physical and psychological scars for many years after their active service ends. And being a, a member of the armed forces, particularly during times of conflict, is immensely stressful, stressful beyond anything I think we could imagine. However, that stressful situation creates 
a level of commitment and an intense bond amongst service personnel that I think is unique to our armed forces. I, I could only uh, listen and try to take it on board uh, when I heard from a soldier who had served in Afghanistan what it was like to come under fire and what the impact on their battalion was when it lost a member of its own who was as close to him as any member of their own family. And I can only imagine how isolated someone must feel if they are discharged from the armed forces into society alone, perhaps with no family support, having had such a close bond with the comrades that they fought with and possibly lost in combat. Going from living in such close quarters with people they considered family, eating, sleeping, working and socialising with the same close group to being discharged into a, a community of strangers who tend not to understand military life and the bond that it uh, creates between between people. And the majority of service men and women make a successful transition into civ civilian life. And the veterans that we have in Scotland are not a problem, they're an asset to communities. Uh, veterans have transferable skills that they may, may not realize they have a point the cabinet secretary made. And those skills become assets to companies and communities. And for the reasons I mentioned earlier, it, it really isn't hard to see why some veterans struggle to adapt and reintegrate, which can put a, a massive strain on family life as well as those without family. I think it, it's vital then that the advice and support services are in place for former service personnel to adjust to living in mainstream society. We must support plans to coordinate and deliver support and advice services from the public, from the private sector, from the voluntary sector, and for ex-service personnel, their partners and their children. And there are, there are too many fantastic organisations providing support and advice to ex-service personnel and their families to mention and do justice to them all. Um, but I did want to, to mention um, some, we have to continue to support those organisations that do that tremendous work in the community for former service personnel ac across Scotland, including, um, for a start, the, the Royal British Legion. The Legion provides practical care, advice and support to armed forces personnel, ex-service men and women of all ages and their families. It runs the, the Poppy Appeal annually and recent appeals have emphasised the increasing need to help the men and women who are serving today as well as ex-service people and their dependents. The Legion also assists any service man or woman to pursue their entitlement to a war disablement pension. And every year, up to 200 ex-service personnel in Scotland are represented at war pensions tribunals. Just across the road from the, the Parliament, we have the Scottish Veterans Red Residencies, which provides residential accommodation to more than 300 ex-service people and their partners, and has helped thousands of veterans throughout Scotland um, since it was established. And we've got uh, SAFA, whose Lanarkshire branch covers my own region of central Scotland. They offer financial, practical, and much needed emotional support to current and previous members of the armed forces and their families through services like Forces Line, which is a, a key service that supports um, service personnel. It's independent from the chain of command. So seven members of the armed forces can go in confidence and they'll receive the support and advice that, that they need. Uh, they also run um, additional, uh, additional needs disability support groups and organize children's, children's holiday runs. Um, that's run by volunteers that offer um, experiences and activities to which some of the children would not um, normally have access. Erskine uh, as well, and that will come on to again in closing, is a leading provider of care for veterans in the country and provides fantastic services uh, within our communities. Uh, these are things that individual members of the Scottish Parliament can do to uh, assist armed forces veterans and their families, supporting some of those charities and the work of the Scottish Vest Veterans Commission is, is just the start of that work. Signing officer, I will close. Um, 
as I open by acknowledging the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in our armed forces in the defence of the freedoms that we take for granted and um, let the Chamber know that we will be supporting the Government's motion at decision time and as always um, more than happy um, to work on a cross-party basis and to support uh, veterans and armed forces personnel in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you for the opening speeches. We now enter the open part of the debate. I call on Bruce Crawford to be followed by Edward Mountain. Mr Crawford. I thank you, President Officer. Um, we are now in our 100th year since the First World War drew to its conclusions. I think it's appropriate, therefore, to take just a little time out to reflect on the important and this important debate on veterans to speak a little bit about the contribution that Stirling and my constituency made during that most hellish of wars. Many members may know that Stirling Castle was the hub for recruitment during World War I. Stirling's central location, its railway access, made it the perfect spot for recruitment in transit of troops and other personnel. Young men trained and gathered at Stirling Castle. They would march down the railway station to complete at the beginning of a journey that would see many of them complete their lives journey in places of horror like the killing fields and the muddy hell that was Flanders. Now, I cannot help but when I attend the remembrance service at the Church of the Holyrood, which is the top of the city of Stirling, as I did past Sunday past, and in the past these men will have walked down past this church on the way to the railway station. I can't help but think of them as part of that remembrance service. Because in, you know, in numbers too many to imagine, they made the ultimate sacrifice then and in the century that has followed, others have done the same. And countless numbers have returned from battlefields of the past and present with broken bodies and broken minds. It's for that reason, amongst others, I think this debate today is so important that we're having on veterans. Now, my own family has some of its own proud connections with the military. One of my sons served in the RAF. My father was in the Royal Hotel Cavalry, and my grandfather fought with the Scottish horse during the First World War. My grandfather fought at Gallipoli, and like many men of his generation, would only very quietly discuss some of the horrors he'd witnessed after a few drams at family gatherings. But these stories I remember as a young man had a real impact on me. And I've no doubt he was left damaged by what he, the horrors he'd witnessed, and particularly in the battles he'd tell us about in regard to the armies of Turkey. Of course, today, he would all have likelihood been recognized as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And today, he'd be able to access services and help from organizations such as PTSD Resolution or Combat Stress, charitable organizations that help veterans re-engage with mainstream life. The PTSD Resolution once said of veterans seeking help, they often find us because their partner has told them, you have to get help because I can't do anything more. You can just see that situation, utter desperation for some of these families who are having to deal with some of these damaged men and, and women who have come back from areas of conflict. And these organizations do an amazing job trying to help them and all the support we can give them, the better. But this tells us, whilst much of the discussion today will undoubtedly be on the importance of making these support services accessible, there's also an important role from families and loved ones to play a role on the recovery journey for some veterans. You know, that's something that we do a lot, lot better today, yes, than was the case for people like my grandfather in the past. President Officer, in the early days of the first SNP minority government, not long after being appointed a minister, uh, the then first minister asked me to take on a role of liaison between the Ministry of Defence and the Scottish government. And the meeting soon after coming into government with the tri-services heads, I recall Alex Salmon saying very powerfully that the armed forces, and particularly our veterans, were part of the vital threads that made up the very tartan of Scotland. What the First Minister was trying to do was say he was pledging that in Scotland we would strive to make veterans' services in Scotland the very best services available anywhere on these islands. 
and at First Minister's questions last week in this chamber, the current First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, laid out in an answer to my question just how some of that pledge has been put into effect. And the Cabinet Secretary referred to some of these matters, as did Maurice Golding and, 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 the, and Corey and, the, and the, their, their opening contributions. And since 2008, more than a million pounds has been invested through the Scottish Veterans Fund to support more than 140 projects across Scotland. Funding has provided invaluable support across important devolved areas, such as housing, health, employment support for veterans. And of course, we now have the Employability Group that has been established to lead work in that area. And £5 million has rightly been committed to ensure that veterans in receipt of social care receive full value for their war pension. The rationale for that was laid out quite well, I think, by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening remarks. President Officer, this work is vital because it's widely known fact that those leaving the armed forces, settling into mainstream life anywhere in the United Kingdom can be a real challenge. And that's reflected in a report which the UK Justice Ministries published earlier this year that showed that 2,500 former armed services personnel began serving prison sentences last year. But this indicates, you know, a real need to address how we continue to improve mental health and well-being amongst the veterans community. Yes, it's true that by far the vast majority of veterans, because of the skills they've gained in the armed services and the values that they come, that they come out of the services with, make quite a quite remarkable contribution to our society and our life in Scotland. But these are real challenges still that we must continue to tackle and face head on in order to ensure that as a society we're offering our veterans the best possible support. President Officer, with these facts in mind, I'd like to pay a bit of a tribute to what the work that's been done by the Stirling Citizens Advice Bureau provide advice and support to armed services and communities and their families. The CAB Armed Services Advice Project works in a, in a funding group that's fronted by Poppy Scotland, who frankly do a quite amazing job in Scotland. It offers support where it can to serving or former armed forces personnel, either regular or service, or their dependents. And this is a crucial lifeline to those who use these services and offers valuable advice and specialist help in a range of areas. Areas including welfare entitlement, debt management, seeking employment, as well as relationships and housing. This support is free, it's confidential, it's impartial. Exactly what many men and women um, who have close connections with the armed forces need in order to help them deal with the everyday stresses of life. Now, I want to commend the government bringing forward this debate today because I think it's hugely important in this week as we've just come past the Remembrance Day services, obviously, and the, the obviously approach of Maurice. Uh, Corey and the way he's gone about his business earlier on today as well. So I, th I commend the government for do bringing this forward and I look, look, look forward to listening to others' contributions this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Graham Day. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank the government for bringing forward this motion for debate. I'd like to declare that I am a veteran, like both Keith Brown and Maurice Corey, and I'd also like to declare that my son is a serving soldier. This really important debate comes at a time of the year in the country when it comes together to remember the sacrifices that were made not only by soldiers, sailors and airmen, but also civilians in the defence of others. I believe that all veterans regularly remember the actions of friends and colleagues, not just on Remembrance Day, but on every day of the year. On this recent Remembrance Sunday, as I always do, I remember the tragic events that happened in London in 1982, where my regiment and friends were targeted by the IRA. I've mentioned this before in the chamber, so I'll not dwell on this. I also thought of those veterans who have put their lives on the line to defend the country and that are still being hounded in their retirement and dragged through the courts to answer accusations that have already been investigated and the case is closed. I want to particularly mention Dennis Hutchings, a former lifeguard who is just one of many veterans who served in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and is facing legal action. Being mindful of what I say, in June 1974, whilst in patro on patrol in country Tyrone, Dennis came across an IRA unit of some 10 men moving arms and ammunition. 
a firefight broke out, which resulted in four people being arrested and the remainder escaping. Just two days later, in the same area, his patrol encountered two men who ran off when challenged. One of the men that ran off was subsequently shot, and it is this incident which Dennis has been charged with. This is despite the two investigations where Dennis was told that the matter was closed. He tried to live a normal life in the same way that John Downey did post the bombing in Hyde Park, which he was accused of. The difference is that Downey received a letter which was admittedly sent in error saying he would not be charged and the, and the, the, with the bombing and that Downey is now free from prosecution. I don't believe it is right to judge the actions of armed forces in combat in the same way that we assess what is acceptable for the behaviour of people in normal society. I believe as parliamentarians we must fulfil our basic duty to our veterans by protecting them from these kind of prosecutions. And I want to quote the UK Defence Committee which stated that subject, uh, to subject former personnel, service personnel to legal pursuit under the current arrangements is wholly oppressive and a denial of natural justice. I therefore welcome the Prime Minister's commitment to make the new legacy bodies fair, balanced and proportionate. And I welcome the UK Government's announcement that the consultation document on the forthcoming draft Northern Ireland Bill will include alternative ways uh, which forward, which will include a statute of limitations. And whilst I accept this is totally a reserved matter, I do hope the Scottish MPs of all parties will support this. Now, whilst the legacy investigations did not form part of Eric Fraser's report, it is an important issue that veterans who have served on active duty have to face, which is why I mention it. Now, I want to commend the Scottish Government for all the actions that they are doing to help veterans. I also want to thank Eric Fraser for his report. I believe it is very difficult to for anyone to argue that we owe so much to those in uniform who, at our behest, have been prepared to put everything on the line. We need to stand beside them, with them, and we need to have their backs when the going gets tough because we have no idea what they faced or the stresses they've had to deal with. Now, before I close, I'd like to briefly mention uh, the importance of regimental and unit charities that, fun that fundraise directly from the public. These charities are so important, not only for veterans, but also for veterans' families. The latter are often excluded from direct governmental support, benefit the flexibilities of charities. And I know, for example, the Household Cavalry Foundation have already helped families and children of soldiers who have served in both the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals, giving them the help that, sadly, they can't get from other sources. On average, the charity allocates £100,000 per year, helping soldiers and their families, and this includes £30,000 to £40,000 paid direct to families and their children. This is but one charity, and the work they undertake for the Household Cavalry is replicated in nearly all units and regiments across the British Army, and Air Force, and Navy. Presiding officer, in summary, I would like to urge the Scottish Government to help protect our armed services cleared by military investigations from being prosecuted many years later for no apparent gain. I would also like to commend the actions taken by the Scottish Government in their work with veterans and urge them to continue to ensure that we repay our debt to our armed service without questioning the need why to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call Graham Day to be, fo Sorry, Graham Day to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Graham Day. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, I have in the process of contributing to previous debates on this subject talked about my late grandfather. It was he who stimulated my interest in the military and veterans and from a very young age. My granddad served in the Gordon Highlanders. He lied about his age to join in 1921 and he worked his way up through the ranks, returning to civilian life in 1945 with the rank of major. Along the way, Major James McIntosh was awarded the Military Cross for Heroism in North Africa. Sadly, he died 45 years ago, as a result of which I was denied the opportunity to engage with him meaningfully around just what he and his comrades had experienced during World War II and how this had impacted them. It's a subject that in adult life I've come to form an interest in. I'm not sure, mind you, about the extent to which you've been willing to open up. Unlike Bruce Crawford's granddad, not even the taking of a dram or two would loosen his tongue. My grandfather founded the 5th 7th Old Comrades Association, a clear indication of the value he and his old pals placed on the common bond they had. 
but he rarely spoke in detail of what they had encountered during the Battle of El Alamein or indeed in Italy. He dismissed the action which won him the military cross as having emanated from finding himself and his men halfway into a minefield before realising where they were and having the choice of either going forward or backwards. And they give him a medal for making the decision he did. I later learned he was recognised in the way he was for dealing with a machine gun nest or two in order to lead his men to safety. In an all too rare moment of opening up though, he did once explain that the 5th 7th amalgamation had come about as a result of the losses the individual battalions had suffered in, the con in conflict. A rather sobering scenario, especially for those who had witnessed the deaths of so many close friends. And now, considerably older than I was when that conversation took place, and mindful of how our understanding of the mental scars left on our service, service personnel have developed, I really do wonder just how badly that generation was let down. That's not a criticism as such. It was a different time. PTSD had never been fully recognised at that point. But oh, how we must have failed so many of our soldiers, sailors and airmen in returning them to civvy life, uh, leaving them to cope however they could with the horrors they had witnessed and multiply that tenfold when considering our treatment of servicemen from the First World War. We cannot change that, of course, but we can and we must ensure all possible support for personnel nowadays, not only those leaving the services with mental or physical issues, but all personnel. And in terms of redressing past wrongs insofar as we, insofar as we can, Des Brown, the then Defence Secretary's decision in 2006 to pardon the 306 British soldiers executed for desertion or cowardice during World War I was a commendable step. We now know these men were likely suffering from PTSD. The family of Private Harry Farr had sought a judicial review following a previous decision not to grant a pardon. Harry Farr fought for two years without respite and was suffering from PTSD when he was shot for cowardice. After he was executed, his family received no military pension and his widow and his daughter were forced out of their house, suffering financial hardship, stigma and shame. Incidentally, the National Theatre of Scotland has begun to chart the story of the 306 and the effect on those left behind. I understand the first two parts have been extremely powerful. The third part of the trilogy is still to come. In this context and in relation to those who may be carrying with them a mental legacy from service, let me pay tribute to the work done by combat stress. I had not realised until the weekend where, whilst taking part in the Remembrance Service in Monifeith, I learned that combat stress will celebrate its centenary in 2019, having been set up a year after the First World War ended. Whilst the state may have been providing little in the way of meaningful care, the founders of combat stress recognised there were thousands of servicemen returning from the front line with severe mental health problems and receiving little or no sympathy let alone support. The charity's founders believed that veterans could be helped to cope with their mental health problems through a rehabilitation programme. In 1919, Combat Stress started providing occupational therapy, with this, and this is still being offered today at its treatment centres and via its community teams. In 2016-17, 10,000 calls were handled by Combat, combat Stress's helpline. More than 2,000 referrals were received by Combat Stress from former servicemen and women struggling with their mental health. Around 1,200 veterans completed their treatment programmes. And positively, 93% of those undertaking the PTSD intensive treatment programme completed it. Over the last 12 months, 269 Scottish veterans have been referred to the charity for the first time, and it currently has 375 veterans in Scotland registered with it. Encouragingly, it seems that veterans are coming forward for help much more early now. On average, veterans used to wait 12 years after leaving the forces to seek help. But combat stress has seen Afghan veterans on average seek help three years after leaving the service and Iraq war veterans four years later. Combat stress has a network of community teams across the country who provide clinical assessment and support to veterans within their own communities. Each team is made up of a community psychiatric nurse and an occupational therapist. Poppy Scotland pop-in centres are used for its community clinics. Combat Stress has three treatment centres, one of which is in Ayrshire, and has taken steps to increase its capacity to, so, to, to support people across the UK since 2012. In 2013, the charity was commissioned as the PTSD specialist provider for veterans in Scotland. The Scottish Government continues to provide funding of 3.6 million over three years to 2018 in partnership with NHS Scotland for the provision of specialist services for veterans resident in Scotland at Hollybush. 
A full range of specialist mental health assessment, treatment, education, advice and support is offered to help recovery and improve the quality of life for those veterans across Scotland who need assistance. It, it is, I believe, taking an important step by utilising peer support. Who better to support veterans than others who have served in our forces and who have had similar experiences. And I'm pleased to note that the Scottish Government is investing in mental health services for veterans, with 825,000 being provided this year to support the Veterans First Point Services Network. There are various centres across Scotland, including one serving Tayside at King's Cross Hospital in Dundee. I understand that combat stress is building positive relationships with the Veterans First Point Network. Uh, Sign officer, at the beginning of the year, I led a members' debate on the Veterans Commissioner's report on employability and skills. Eric Fraser's latest paper is on health and well-being. He seeks to correct the misconception that veterans' health is worse than that of the general population, but does note that their needs can differ. This paper has been welcomed by Combat Stress. I look forward to reading the reports, which the Commissioner details will follow on from his paper. And I look forward to the Scottish Government building on the targeted and very significant support it currently provides for our veterans. Presiding officer. I do have a bit of time in hand, so I'm happy to be generous with speeches and, of course, interventions. And I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, presiding officer. And I, too, uh, would like to echo the welcomes that have come from across this chamber for the fact that this uh, debate has come forward. And, and indeed, um, as I was preparing uh, for this debate, my thoughts turned to my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather died just uh, over a year and a half ago. Uh, he served in the RAF, uh, the majority of his service uh, in Fort William, um, uh, working with Mountain Rescue. Um, at a, a critical time when that service was really in the, at the point of transition from having been an exclusively uh, military function, one that was founded in order to rescue downed airmen during the Second World War to one that is now the, the civilian service that we recognise today. But what it made me think was that at this point in time and at this time of year, that that, that direct experience of service, um, of either conflict of itself or, or of, of service in the military, is something that is becoming less common. 20, 30, 40 years ago, most of us would have had a family member who had either seen action in the Second World War or at the very least served um, uh, you know, in, in, through national service in, in one of our armed services. And that fact that that direct experience of service is, is one that is diminishing, I think means that we, we need to take greater care, that we need to change our thoughts and views of what remembrance means. And of course, remembrance must always be first and foremost about remembering those who have served, those who paid the ultimate price, those who fought um, to secure our, our freedoms and liberty. But I think it was also incumbent that remembrance is about wider understanding about what service means and the armed forces means. And, and in particular, I think that, that serving the armed forces, yes, it is sometimes about that ultimate sacrifice, that ultimate duty, but it's also about that wider, richer experience that often is involved in the armed forces, the, the broad range of different things like mountain rescue, the other functions that the armed forces carry out. And I'd, I'd like to make some remarks about that through my speech. Um, but I'd also um, like to, uh, I think, reflect on, on the points that have been made by other members about transition. Um, and I have to say, as I make these remarks, I do so very mindful that we're very lucky for this debate to be being led by people such as, as Keith Brown, Maurice Corey and Edward Mountain have actually seen that actually, because I, I have to only imagine in, um, what that transition must be like, and it's something that they can speak to very directly. But, but very clearly, um, coming out of the armed forces is a, a very significant issue that, that those who are doing it have to take place. For, for anyone changing jobs, there's a huge number of considerations that you, you have to go through. The, the thought about what skills you will need, what the differences will be in your new job compared to your current job. But coming out of the armed forces, it's not just simply a matter of tasks or responsibilities that change. It's a whole way of life. And I think Mark Griffin put it very well when he described it as coming out of a family and into potentially a community of strangers. So on that note, I think we are absolutely right, I think, to praise the work of Eric Fraser. I think the, 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 uh, the Veterans Commissioner has done an excellent work highlighting the many issues around um, uh, transition that, that our veterans face, and I think in particular around skills. Because the fact is many of our service men and women have highly relevant skills in a broad range of areas. And indeed, we often hear about the skills gaps 
that we have in our economy. So I would urge the government to look very carefully to make sure that we are maximising the use of those skills. Certainly in my previous career, I worked alongside a number of uh, uh, people who come from the RAF with extremely deep digital skills, who had highly uh, 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 useful IT skills and were using them successfully. And again, we, we, we often think about people in the armed forces as primarily being combatants, but we have highly skilled technicians and engineers, and we need to make sure that we're using those skills when they come out. In particular, I'd like to highlight on uh, the, the recommendation 11 in the uh, skills uh, paper brought forward by the, the, the commissioner, talking about a plan for early service leavers in particular. I think it's vital that we upskill and, and make sure that we have retraining possibilities. So I very much welcome uh, what Keith Brown has said around Apprenticeship Week and the world of work. But around these early service leavers, the Scottish Government did agree to a plan by May 2017, and I, I, and I certainly am not aware that it has been produced yet. So I was just wondering if the Minister might be able to clarify the status of the report and that plan. But I think it also makes a, a, a broader point that I, I, I think that we need to make sure that not just that, that, um, that uh, people leaving the armed forces have the information available to them, but I think we need to make as far as possible that that transition is integrated and seamless, so that they start that skills journey before they leave their armed forces, that their learning experiences in the armed forces are actually one that link directly to their opportunities afterwards. And I also would say that it's not necessarily just about modern apprenticeships or the skills regime. We must also look about articulation and other education issues. And I think the articulation point is one that is, was made by the commissioner. But I think all of these points around how uh, people access different points of the education system, move between them um, and onto other ones, are actually also important for people in the armed forces. And we need to ask that question about how are these education matters relevant to people in the armed forces, I think when we discuss them, and I think articulation, making sure that people get credit for the skills and experience they have in their armed forces, is actually a particularly important one. I'd also like to briefly mention housing. And I think that it is, is very welcome that you know, better information is being provided to uh, veterans and those about to leave um, the armed forces. But I think there are still issues, and certainly I've had dealings with casework with people who are about to leave and absolutely are looking for council housing, but the reality is they're having to move across the city, ripping up those family routes, uh, the issues around schools and the, the ability for their family to continue uh, their, 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 their life. Uh, and indeed, that's, a, that's a, 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 an issue for, for people not necessarily quite inside my constituency, but certainly there's MOD housing um, just beyond my constituency boundaries. And I think this does remain uh, a, a, an issue. And the one other point with this, and I think talking about, the, about transition and the reality of it, is that those issues around transition don't always happen at the point that that person leaves the armed forces. And I, I think uh, Bruce Crawford uh, made a very good point around um, the, 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 the shocking statistics that we often hear about the, the, uh, the, the proportion of uh, armed forces people that end up in prison. Because I think very often these issues that come to light uh, following transition don't always happen immediately. They quite often happen further down the line. And I think it's very important that we make sure that we keep an ongoing relationship and communication with service people so that we can catch those problems. Because at the moment, I'm not sure that we, we do. Um, would you like me to conclude? The one just final point is that I, I was very taken on my recent visits with the Armed Visit, Visit Programme, just the, the great rich variety of things that the armed forces do themselves around health, emotional well-being, around skills. And so my final point is this, is I think that this debate is as much about making sure that we help people as they come out of the armed forces, but perhaps that point of cooperation and partnership, I would also say that there are many things that we can learn about public policy from the armed forces themselves, because they do a great deal of work around such things as health, emotional well-being, and skills. And I think there are possibly some lessons for us to learn from them as well. Thank you very much. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, first of all, associate myself with the remarks of the Cabinet Secretary on the disgraceful proposed closure of Glencore's barracks in my constituency, something we've debated in here before. I want to turn to the 
And the last sentence, practically, of the motion, which says the Scottish Government should continue to work in partnership to ensure that the armed forces, veterans and their families receive the best possible support and access to opportunities across Scotland. I want to focus my contribution in a completely different direction from others on the opportunities which are or ought to be available to the spouses and partners and indeed the children of serving personnel. And I want to do that with particular reference to a programme run by Women's Enterprise Scotland, WES. Uh, this is a business creation project supported by the Scottish Government through its general funding to Women's Enterprise Scotland and the Armed Forces Covenant, which supports it to the tune of 20,000, not a lot of money. And its purpose is to unlock the business potential of military spouses and partners. This is a 10-week training course, and in a report on the project published in February this year, 76% of participants took steps to create a business during the course, and by the end of the course, 100% of participants reported they had the confidence to set up a business. The project, which I have visited, as has the Cabinet Secretary, is based, as I say, at Glencorse in my constituency. There's a one and a half hour face to face workshop held each week with online support. A creche much needed is provided, all the toddlers do tend to invade the meetings. And a group of wives also came to Parliament to explain their projects, which varied from massage to mask making. I have a picture to prove myself with the latter. But I also thank colleagues who attended. And I know the wives and partners were very pleased to see colleagues there. Wes has successfully received, secured from the MOD Covenant Fund a further £20,000 of another 10-week course. And I've been on a visit to see that one again. We have there a monster maker, special effects artist, an HR consultancy, a virtual assistant, a retailer of slogan and personalised T-shirts, I have one on order, not for myself, it's my brother's Christmas present, and gifts, a bath bomb maker, a massage therapist, and soft furnishing supplier. Now, all of the above are businesses with market opportunities, but they do need the support and business insights to enable them to transition from a possibility to a business reality and a career prospect. But there is more to the course than business, important though that is. Military wives and partners find it nigh on impossible to take on regular employment due to the peripatetic nature of military life. We all know that. They are also often on their own with children for months on end and far removed from close family. And while they support each other, this project builds self-confidence, is very sociable, and in a way gives them back that sense of independence. Because of the nature of their partners working in the armed forces, their ambitions often have to take second place. But this programme offers them something they can achieve all for themselves. I would even go so far as to say it adds to providing a positive and stable home environment for their partners who are active in the armed forces when they return, because it gives the wives and partners something they're achieving on their own terms for themselves. And I think that's very important when you actually give up quite a bit of yourself to support, quite rightly, your husband or partner in the armed forces. Indeed, some business projects may very well grow into something more substantial, as with internet sales and advertising through Facebook and so on. If the husbands move base or are posted abroad, the wives' work can travel with them. It's not fixed, it's online. However, the continuation of the project, indeed extending it elsewhere, is, as most things in life, dependent on funding. So I'm delighted that the funding has continued to give ongoing support to the women who start up in business, because there's more to it once you start up. You must then enable them to support the growing businesses, to integrate them more with the local business community, and grow the business links, contacts, and networks, which are critical to the growth and sustainability. So with more funding, it would support another new group of women along the road. We've got a 10-week one going now to start up a business. And as they move forward, being able to network them with other women who preceded them in their existing businesses. That way they get peer support and access to mentoring. And it also helps them with the sustainability. So I would therefore be pleased to see the MOD backing more of these projects. 
and see because it works so well. Now, you don't need to take my word for it. If you log on to startupwithwes.com, you can read that report from February for yourselves and see how worthwhile it is. And I commend it to other colleagues in here who have armor barracks in their areas and who haven't had a project such as this set up. So, as I say, in a different tack, this is about supporting the wives and partners of active personnel now and for the future so that they can have an independent career in life for themselves. And I thought it was important to bring that particular issue to the Chamber amongst the other contributions. Thank you very much. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Tom Arthur. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to be speaking in this debate about the Scottish Government support for our veterans. And I'm happy to have been following Christine Graham, who's mentioned Glen Coast Barrack several times in her contribution. Of course, I spent my first two years, my 15 years in the army in Glen Coast Barracks and uh, with the Scottish Infantry, so I know it well. Uh, and I also uh, just want to make clear that Liberal Democrats will, of course, fully support the government's motion and the Conservative Amendment uh, tonight, and I hope it's supported unanimously across the chamber. And it's heartening to hear such support for our veterans from right across the chamber. However, I want to take this opportunity to raise a case where the government support has not been exactly fulsome. I refer, of course, to a lifeline service, the Veterans First Point Centres, first set up in Scotland with money gathered from UK banks and LIBOR fines. That funding has run out. The Scottish Government offered to continue funding the First Point Centres, but would only guarantee 50% of the funding, the other 50% to come out of health board budgets. The Veterans First Point Service is, as I say, a lifeline service, and six of the eight centres are still open because their health boards are stepping into the breach. Unfortunately, Grampian and Highland centres are closed. So why are they closed? They're closed because no funding could be found, even with 50% funding from the Scottish Government. Doesn't let the Scottish Government off the hook here, though. I lay the responsibility for these closures squarely at the collective feet of Scottish ministers, particularly the health ministers, and it's a pity that Maureen Watt, whose responsibility this particular issue is, isn't here to, to hear that. Now, I, I, I don't doubt the sincerity of the minister on the front bench at the moment. Keith Brown has done a lot of work. But I'm... Yes, of course. Bruce Crawford. I'm glad you raised the point of sincerity, Mike Rumbles, because I understand your, why you've directed your um, attack upon the Scottish government. But surely there is also a role here for the UK government and why are you not addressing that particular issue as well, if this is a serious attempt to get real funding in to that organisation? Because this is not just about the Scottish Government. Yeah, well, I'll, Mike I'll, I'll pursue this, and I'll show you why I'm blaming the Scottish Government in a, in a moment. So let me focus on the service that was available in Grampian, because that's what I know best. The Gra Veterans First Point Grampian Centre completed its service to our veteran community on Friday the 22nd of September. In its closure notice, it said... Veterans in this area should contact their GP for health-related issues and the Veterans First Point Scotland team for their closest centre. But their nearest centre available to them is in the NHS Tayside area. That's what the government and Grampian Health Board mean when they say that, and I quote, their needs will continue to be met through mainstream services. In other words, go and visit your GP. The reason why the Jampion, Grampian service closed its doors on the 22nd of September was simply because the cash-strapped health board could not afford to make its 50% contribution. And here I'm answering the question, why could NHS Grampian not fund a service for its veterans when other boards could? Well, it's all down to funding from the Scottish Government. Last week, the Parliament's own independent information service informed us all in the Chamber that the Scottish Government failed to meet its own funding targets, its own funding targets for NHS Grampian every year since 2009. It has shortchanged NHS Grampian to the tune of £165.6 million over this period. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, so that no one misunderstands me here, that is the Scottish Government's own target. It already fails people in Grampian area by giving it the lowest funding target of any health board anywhere. Per head of population, NHS Grampian is only targeted to receive 90% of the average funding per head of population. To take away £165 million over this period has a cumulative and devastating effect on patient care. 
No wonder there were 3,700 fewer planned operations last year. No wonder the waiting times to be seen are over ex ever extending. And no wonder that an NHS Grampian doesn't have the funding to keep the first point service for veterans running. This is, I would hope everyone across the chamber, everyone across the chamber would ac accept that this is not an acceptable situation. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Cabinet Secretary has come to the Chamber today to say how much the Scottish Government supports veterans, and I believe he is sincere. He has done personally a great deal of work, and so has the Scottish Government. But it's not all good work. I believe uh, when, when health ministers preside over this sorry state of affairs, I believe it isn't good enough. Deputy Presiding Officer, actions speak louder than words. We can't all sit around in this chamber saying life is rosy for our veterans when services are closing down because they're underfunded. I would like, what would I like to see? I would like to see the government take action here, and I hope Keith Brown will, because I know he is sincere in this. I would like to see the government take action and restore the lifeline service to the veterans resident in the Northeast. Thank you. Tom Arthur to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, presiding officer. I am very grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate and I would like to thank Keith Brown and the Scottish Government for bringing this motion to Parliament which allows each of us the opportunity to show our thanks and support for the valued contribution that our armed forces and veterans community makes to Scotland and I, I want to recognise the tone and the tenor of the contributions well almost all of the contributions in this debate this afternoon in particular I was uh, struck by something that uh, Daniel Johnson said he spoke of 30 or 40 years ago would be the time for perhaps every family across Scotland and the UK would have a, a member who had either was serving in the forces or, or, hard serve, or had served and in a way that would, in a, in the power that had to potentially for knitting communities, to, uh, communities together. And I, I was struck by something that uh, Bruce Crawford stated, he spoke of his grandfather serving um, in I think in a mounted regiment in Gallipoli, my, my own great grandfather Hugh McCabe of the Ayrshire Yeomanry served at Gallipoli too. And these threads, a century old, still bind us together. Presiding officer, on Remembrance Sunday, I had the honour of laying reefs in Kilbarkin, Lochwinnock, Nielsen and Barhead in my constituency of Renfrewshire South. What is always a particularly poignant moment was made more so when I met a constituent at the Remembrance Service in Barhead who had known my maternal grandmother, Arthur McGettigan. My grandfather died over a decade before I was born. However, I had heard many stories of him. That he, as a student, he was the Ducks of St. John's in Barhead, of his employment at the foreman of the pottery at the Shanks Works, of his membership of the Knights of St. Columba and his involvement in setting up the Columba Club in Barhead, and that, having been a volunteer at Citizens Advice, he had even considered running for the local council. In that chance meeting with my constituent last Sunday at the Remembering Service in Barhead, I also learned that my grandfather, or Big Arthur, as he was known, was the person people called upon if they required help with just about anything, and that he was also apparently a fine dancer in great company. He was, in short, a pillar of the Barhead community. Presiding officer, Arthur McGettigan served not only his community, but also his country. As a sergeant in the Royal Artillery in the Second World War, he saw action in Greece, North Africa, and Italy. From that conflict, the lessons of which perhaps have never been more relevant, my grandfather carried not only the scars of shrapnel, but also a sense of leadership and duty that he carried into his post-service life, both as a reservist and in the Barhead community. That nearly 46 years after his death, he could be spoken of so fondly as by the constituent I met and remembered on Sunday, speaks to the profoundly positive impact that those who serve and have served in our armed forces are capable of making on our lives and to our communities. It is important and proper that in this parliament and in each of our communities that we represent and we continue to recognize that contribution. Such a, an opportunity was afforded to me earlier this year when I attended the Renfrewshire Provost Awards. It was there that the 102nd Field Squadron 71st Engineer Reg Regiment of the Army Reserve based in Paisley were awarded the freedom of Renfrewshire as well as recently serving in Iraq, Afghanistan and South Sudan, the squadron has helped with floods in Renfrewshire and across the UK, as well as supporting local charities and family days. 
and Renfrewshire's association with the armed forces and veterans community goes further. It is also, of course, home to Erskine, a name associated with the care of veterans for over a century. Also in Renfrewshire is the Scottish War Blinded's newly opened Hawks, Hawk Head Centre, which is a state-of-the-art daytime activity centre for veterans with sight loss. These are services and support that I know are very much welcomed by our forces and veterans communities right across the west of Scotland. Presiding officer, next year will of course mark the centenary of the end of the First World War, and a year that will offer much opportunity for reflection on the contribution and sacrifices made by our armed forces and veterans. It will also afford the opportunity to consider how we can strengthen our support for serving personnel, veterans and their families. In this regard, it is timely that next year will also mark 10 years since the creation of the Scottish Veterans Fund. Since then, as other colleagues have noted, over a million pounds has been committed to over 140 projects. And I'm pleased to see that this fund has been redeveloped in partnership with Standard Life Aberdeen to provide dedicated fund additional funding focused on employability. This will complement the Scottish Government's continuing work on employability, such as the Veterans Employability Strategic Group and the Capitalising on Military Talent Toolkit, which supports employers in understanding the skills veterans have to offer. Along with developing support for early or young service leavers and exploring ways to highlight best practice within public service recruitment, it's clear that the Scottish Government is working hard to ensure that no veteran faces a disadvantage in securing employment as they transition to civilian life. Presiding officers, there are, of course, many other areas um, that I could cover, including housing, health and support for the children and families of both serving personnel and veterans. However, in coming to a close, I would like to recognise the amendment in the name of Maurice Corey. Our third sector indeed makes an invaluable contribution to the care and welfare of our veterans and forces community. Equally, however, and I'm sure Maurice Corey and members would agree, veterans and our forces community make a, an invaluable contribution also to both the running of veterans charities and the wider third sector. Presiding officer, it is an honour to represent the four season veterans community of Renfrewshire South and our Scottish Parliament. It is a dedication, professionalism and courage of our armed forces that guarantees each of this, us in this place and beyond the privilege to live in a free and democratic society. I look forward to continuing to support our forces and veterans community and supporting the Scottish government, Government's work to ensure the armed forces, veterans and their families receive the best support and access to opportunities across Scotland. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important issue and take the chance to commend our courageous veterans. Now, my family doesn't have a long history in the armed forces. However, my, my great uncle did serve in the Somme as a blacksmith and, and looked after the now uh, famous war horses. And uh, during the, the, the summer recess, uh, colleagues across the chamber were fortunate enough to spend some time uh, with the armed forces at uh, Lossiemouth and hear firsthand some of the issues that not only uh, their, our armed forces, but uh, their partners uh, have in uh, living in and moving around the country uh, sometime with little notice. And I think I can speak for everyone here in the chamber today when I say that we're enormously grateful for the service they play for our country. And at this time in particular, they're very much uh, to the forefront of our thoughts. That being said, their service to our country does not end when they finish their deployment and neither should our support for these men and women. After returning from combat, veterans are too often left to face a harsh and unique transition back to ordinary life. 33% of ex-service personnel feel isolated or lonely due to mental or physical health issues. This is a deeply concerning statistic. While this may not represent all veterans' experience, it is imperative that acknowledge and show our support for veterans as they readjust. I'm pleased to see that both the Scottish and the UK government are taking action to tackle this issue. Third sector veteran charities play a vital role in helping with this complex transition. Last year, Armed Forces Charities helped over 22,000 individuals find employment and over 3,000 individuals gain qualifications. Charities also help veterans with other less 
discussed hardships of readjustment, including providing advice and housing services. I would like to take this moment to highlight two charities in my constituency of Galloway and West Dumfries. South West Scotland r and provide activity holidays for injured servicemen that have returned from action, more particularly at the moment from, uh, or, or recently from Afghanistan. Next January will mark their ninth anniversary as a host for service personnel. Since they opened, they've hosted well over 400 returning servicemen in their house on the coastal village of Kirsthorn on the beautiful Sorway Firth and what everybody around the chamber recognises as Scotland's most beautiful constituency and what will hopefully be Scotland's third national park. But these serv servicemen are provided accommodation uh, along with uh, bereaved families for a week-long holiday filled with outdoor activities and plenty of good local food. South West Scotland r and allows ex-servicemen to take a real holiday and break in a friendly and comfortable location away from military rules. It provides a much deserved needed place of peace and for our, armed force, for our armed forces, and I'm incredibly grateful for the service they provide right in the heart of my community. Dumfries and Galloway is also uh, home to uh, a section of uh, SAFA, the Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen and Families Association. The branch exists for veterans and veterans' families around Dumfries and Galloway and helps them find emotional, financial and practical support. As part of the National SAFA charity, this branch is committed to serving our armed forces and their families in whatever way they can with their network of trained volunteers in the community and on military bases. It's important to acknowledge that the readjustment period is different for each veteran and their family. SAF has a wide range of services from housing support to men mental illness uh, counselling allows them to help each serviceman in whatever way they need most. The Dumfries and Galloway branch plays a vital role for veterans in the community and their mission and will work with, uh, with continued support from myself and other members across the chamber. Third sector veterans charities such as Southwest r and and SAFA have an invaluable role to play in supporting veterans and their families. It is a role to ensure that these charities, it's our role that these charities should continue to grow and provide continual aid. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Eric Fraser, a Royal Navy veteran of 37 years service. Mr. Fa Fraser is Scotland's inaugural Veterans Commissioner since the office was created in 2014. I commend the move by the Scottish Government to bring veterans' needs into consideration when government ministers are looking at new legislation. The Veterans Commissioner, and I quote, considers Scotland's approach to be largely encouraging, but there is, room for, there is no room for complacency and I'm convinced that more can and needs to be done. By no stretch of the imagination does the system need overhauled. This is very reassuring, but Mr Fraser notes that often local authorities, government agencies and housing providers providing general information about housing options in Scotland simply fail to reach veterans and service leavers, more often because it's poorly presented, managed and disseminated. The government is making good progress in communicating with our veterans, but we should also be conscious of how we present and provide help to the community. The government is within reach of securing this, and I once again commend the action taken so far. Presiding officer, in conclusion, veterans can play and do play an essential part in our communities, not just because of the experience they've gained through service, but also actively providing our local communities with invaluable attributes and skills and uh, they should pass that on to others. Key stakeholders such as government and charities should treat them not as helpless and lost, but as the most valuable and strong members we can have in our community, and they deserve our support whenever needed. The last contribution in the open debate is Richard Lockhead. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Given that many of us were laying wreaths on Sunday to pay tribute to the fallen, and those who had served their country and defended their values, it's very appropriate to have this debate today. And there's been many fine contributions from all parties around the chamber. And the cabinet secretary kicked off the debate speaking about changing landscapes. And I guess one changing landscape has been the political landscape in Scotland in relation how, to how we can support veterans in this country. So we must not forget and always put into perspective the fact that since we've had devolution 
and particularly since the SNP government was elected in 2007, we have the first Veterans Minister, we have the Veterans Fund, and of course we've got Scotland's first Veterans Commissioner as well, in the form of Eric Fraser, who's in the gallery today, and I join others in paying tribute to his good work and the many good issues that he's highlighted. And I thank him uh, today for visiting Forest in my constituency a few months ago, where we met some local people and discussed some of the issues facing veterans in the local community. The other changing landscape, of course, is my own constituency in Murray, which has played such a key role in defending the nation throughout the 20th and now this the 21st century. And of course, largely that has been through the presence of the RAF and the Navy over those years. And even today, as you go about Murray, you'll see many symbols, particularly from World War II. The beach defences, which are now under the care of the Forestry Commission, uh, are, are still there. And a tourist attraction in their own right. Uh, and of course, the uh, now redundant many airfields in the area are there to see for visitors uh, and local people uh, alike. Today, of course, we have RAF Lossiemouth, which is the only RAF base in Scotland, and we have the Kinloss Barracks, which was formerly the RAF Kinloss base. Uh, so there's still a huge presence for the military uh, in Murray today, and so many men and women are still playing their role uh, in defending the country uh, and doing their good work. As a result of that presence over the last century or so, uh, as well as today's presence with these uh, two establishments, there are many, many veterans that live in Murray. And as I've said before, I think if we were to measure the number of veterans as a percentage of the population in Murray, we must be the, uh, up the top of the league or near the top of the league in terms of, of the whole of Scotland. Of course. Keith Brown. Thank uh, Richard Lockhead for taking intervention and the point that he was making about the preponderance of veterans in his constituency, there also tend to be extremely highly qualified veterans uh, in his area. And again, it goes back to the point that Daniel Johnson made. Would he um, think it worthwhile talking to the local council in Murray to suggest that one way of encapsulating, keeping that huge reservoir of highly skilled individuals, some of whom have set up companies after having left the RAF, that they could perhaps incorporate a proposal around their growth deal to both ourselves and the UK government to maximise and retain those skills in the local area. Richard Lockhead. Well, I think the Cabinet Secretary is expecting it's a very good point, and I certainly will take that point away with me because it's very clearly the case that our veterans play such a crucial role in both Murray's social life, uh, but particularly in our economic life uh, as well. And many of the people you come across in Murray society are veterans. And of course, many of my friends are veterans in Murray. And I'll always remember a few years ago having a pint with a friend in the local pub. And then it dawn on, dawning on me, he just returned from military action a week or two previously. And there we were just talking about life uh, in general. It does bring back to you the various backgrounds that people have uh, in your local community, but particularly in terms of the number of veterans that we do have in Murray. And many people who have left, particularly with the closure of RAF and Loss, have started up their own businesses in the area and are now supplying jobs and economic growth in their own right. And how can I have uh, this debate without mentioning Windswept Brew Brewers, who produce fantastic craft beers and are doing extremely well at the moment. I think the Cabinet Secretary had the pleasure of uh, tasting one of the beers at a recent uh, reception in Parliament. And Al Reid and Nigel Tiddy, who started that now growing business, are former RAF pilots. And not surprisingly, of course, even though my favourite beer they produce is the, the Blonde Pale Ale, they have beers named after Tornado and Typhoon uh, as well to keep in with the theme of the RAF uh, in Lossiemouth uh, and Murray. And of course, the voluntary sector is very dependent on veterans uh, in the area uh, as well. I was uh, visiting a local scout camp at Spiney recently, uh, where I was taught map reading by one of the volunteers, of course, who is a former... Um, former um, I think he was a pilot, perhaps, or navigator in the RAF, and he was teaching the kids uh, and me uh, map reading. So the, the local voluntary sector is very well supported by veterans. But that transition that many people have mentioned from civilian, uh, to civilian life, from military life, is sometimes seen as a battle in its own right and does present often many challenges for many people. And Morris Corey, of course, had a very good debate a few months ago on the combat stress report, which highlighted many of those issues. The fact that many of the people uh, it suggested uh, who were veterans in Scotland tended to be found in areas of deprivation and many of the people in those areas had mental health issues to deal with. And that's why the Scottish Government's many initiatives that have been spoken about today play such a valuable role in supporting people with that transition and settling back into civilian life and dealing with many of the challenges uh, they face. 
If I was to make a couple of quick points before I finish, firstly, there are so many organisations out there helping, so many. I think Maurice Corey said around 320 charities in Scotland who are helping veterans, that sometimes I think it's quite difficult to navigate what each one delivers and, and raise awareness of them at the same time so that the many thousands of veterans in each of our communities can take advantage of the services that are on offer. And in terms of veterans' first point, which was raised by Mike Rumbles, I very much take on board the Cabinet Secretary's uh, view of that situation. I have had constituents in contact with me from Forest who do lament the decline of the, that particular service. Uh, and I think that reinforces the case for marshalling the other services and 320 charities out there so that their services are available and there's much awareness of what's available there amongst the veteran uh, community. And my final point is, in terms of my own constituency, but indeed the rest of Scotland, given the number of veterans who serve in RAF, I think next year being the centenary of the RAF is an ideal opportunity for the Scottish Government and the rest of Parliament and others in society to celebrate the role of the RAF and the many veterans uh, throughout previous uh, periods of history who have served in the RAF and I think that will be an ideal opportunity to revisit some of the issues we're discussing today. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Mark Griffin around eight minutes please Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I, I would close as I open the debate by restating the continued support we give to our armed forces, personnel uh, and veterans. We do owe a, a great debt of gratitude to members of the armed forces and veterans. And, and some of us will be thinking particularly about uh, family members who served in World War I as we approach 100 years from the end of that particular war. My own um, family, my great great uncle um, served in World War I, and my family history is um, all uh, based around Kilsyth and Croy in the old um, village of Auchenstarry. And I would have expected my great great uncle to uh, follow along with a, a great many of uh, Bruce Crawford's constituents to go through that route from Stirling and deploy from there. But my gran had given me his. Uh, mm -hmm soldier's bible from the first world war and it was uh, gifted to him to the to him uh, as they deployed from the provost of rutherglen so i'm not sure how he ended up deploying from rutherglen whenever when i would have expected him to to deploy with the, their gales from stirling but but anyway maybe i'll get down to the bottom of that uh, particular element of my own family history if anyone's able to to help me out in the centenary year but those seven in our armed forces are asked to make massive personal sacrifices in their human rights, and some ultimately uh, do give up their right to life in service of our country. And it's, in return, uh, it's only right that governments and we uh, as a nation value, respect and support our armed forces. And that, that does culminate in the annual commemoration of Armistice Day. Well, we stop to remember those who have given their lives in action so that we could enjoy the, the, freedom, the freedom we experience um, today. And some members may know that uh, I spent some time in the, the Territorial Army and I would have to say that while I haven't had the same experience, um, that same experience in any other situation in life, I, I didn't go through, uh, I did go through all the training a reservist can, but I didn't deploy for a um, a number of reasons, but even then, with the, the level of experience that I did have, I still can't uh, begin to imagine the, the level of intensity and commitment uh, to their fellow soldiers of those who, who served on the front line. As, as I said in the, the, my opening contribution, I could only listen and try and comprehend when hearing from a young soldier who'd served in Afghanistan what it was like to, to come under heavy fire, what it was like to lose uh, a fellow soldier from his battalion. Uh, that was a, a loss to him as great as any member of his own uh, family. I only again imagine how isolated someone must feel if they're discharged from the armed forces into society alone, perhaps with no family, after having such a close bond uh, to the comrades they fought with and possibly lost in, in combat. It's, it's then a real vital importance that the advice and support services are in place for former service personnel to adjust to living in mainstream society and that governments continue to plan, co 
coordinate and deliver the support and advice services from the public, private and voluntary sectors for ex-service personnel and their families and children. And I welcome that most local authorities have now appointed veterans champions and that they are starting, uh, they're working and starting to deliver real positive changes in those local authority areas. The, the cabinet secretary mentioned in his opening speech the issue around social housing, social landlords, and th there is the example um, that I often give of North Lanarkshire Council, who have amended their housing policy to recognise the priority needs of um, ex-service personnel and their families who have just been discharged and given extra points and, and extra priority um, in coming through that housing application system. And as well as our, our local authorities um, and the actions that government take, we should also continue to support the work, by done, the work done by the many charities um, across Scotland. We've heard a lot of the examples um, today. Graham Day mentioned combat stress and had the privilege of uh, visiting Hollybush House in Ayrshire in the last session of Parliament and speaking to some of the veterans that were there. And one of the, the big issues that, that kept coming up was around access to the uh, concessionary travel card for veterans and I know that's something that um, there's work uh, has already been underway on that that uh, disabled or injured veterans already qualify for that uh, national entitlement card now and that that, that was a, a positive a positive step that there's Erskine that, that Tom Arthur mentioned who are uh, the leading provider of care for veterans in the, the country providing care across a wide range and from respite and short breaks, residential and nursing care, dementia care, palliative care, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, and rehab care. And the Erskine themselves are now working in partnership with the British Legion to create 40 jobs in a new manufacturing centre. Um, there was an announcement, an announcement in the news today uh, which stated that a manufacturing centre staffed by Scottish veterans is to open next year, offering a, a lifeline to many ex-service personnel, uh, what is going to be known as Scotland's bravest manufacturing company. It will now produce rail and road signs, recycle wooden products, and provide print and mail service. Uh, another f fantastic example of the work being done by charities that, that we should um, do all that we can to support. We're committed to continuing to work on a cross-party basis to ensure that our veterans and their families receive the support that they need and deserve. In particular, we recognise that our service personnel often need help with their transition to civilian life, particularly in finding housing and employment and a recognition that those who leave the service can be a physical and psychological, psychological scars for many years after their service ends. The presiding officer, th this has been another good consensual debate on the need to support our armed forces and veteran community in Scotland. And I close again as I open by acknowledging the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in defence of the freedom in our, in our armed forces and that, they will, that we will be supporting the government motion, the, the Conservative amendment at decision time and we are willing as always to work on a cross-party basis to support veterans in Scotland. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr. Nine minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to close for the Scottish Conservatives today and for the avoidance of doubt, if there was any, I can confirm this party support for the government's motion. Firstly, I would like to thank Keith Brown for bringing forward this debate. As has been pointed out at various points throughout today's debate, it's important that we pay tribute to our armed forces and veterans community and that we recognise the immense contribution that they have made to Scottish society. And what is that contribution? Well, many such as I can only imagine. I think uh, Daniel Johnson made a very important point at the outset when he suggested that perhaps people like me have no idea of the stresses that uh, these people have faced or the stresses that they've had to deal with. Uh, and I suspect he's right that the likes of Keith Brown, Maurice Corrie, Ed Mountain and others in, in this chamber 
uh, know much more than they would let on. And I thought Bruce Crawford spoke very movingly uh, and in a personal capacity uh, that made it very real uh, about his grandfather, I think it was. Uh, and that's why debates like this are so important. Uh, above all, to acknowledge, as Edward Mountain said, that these people have, at our request, been prepared to put everything on the line, their health, their sanity, their families, their very future. The motion also flags the excellent work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, Eric Fraser, and his team. Uh, all of the Veterans Commissioner's reports, as my colleague Maurice Corey rightly pointed out, have recommended some ambitious plans for the Scottish Government and have allowed today for a productive and insightful debate. Various areas were explored both by the Commissioner and throughout this debate. Uh, one vital area for veterans and their families being housing. And now ensuring appropriate housing is available to every veteran and their family in Scotland must be a priority. As Maurice Corrie said about the Veterans Commissioner's housing report, veterans need better information from the Scottish Government and from the MOD, but also local authorities must be training their frontline staff to deliver that information in an appropriate and accessible way. I thought Daniel Johnson, again, was right to call for better information, and uh, I thought he was right to speak about the families of those leaving and their situation. The transition from military life is one of the most crucial periods in determining what challenges and opportunities will present themselves to a veteran following their service. And I therefore thought that the motion's point about continuing to work in partnership to ensure that our armed forces, veterans and their families receive the best possible support and access to opportunities was picked up very well, especially by the likes of Bruce Crawford talking about, I think, the CAB in Stirling. Uh, and I would also particularly like to flag Christine Graham's contribution, uh, who ran with Daniel's point uh, about spouses and partners and children. Uh, I agree, we mustn't forget those individuals. And I, I have to say, I really enjoyed learning about the contribution of Women's Enterprise Scotland, uh, unlocking business potential. Uh, and there's clearly something there and clearly something to, to, to develop. And I'm pleased further funding has been secured uh, and I shall certainly, and I would encourage other members, as Christine Graham did, to investigate startupwithwes.com after this debate. A number of members referred to... Yes, of course. Gillian Martin. As the convener of the cross-party group on women in enterprise, I would like to invite you to come along and hear from Wes and the other work that they do. Liam Kerr, there's an offer you cannot refuse. <laughs> and I don't intend to refuse it. I'd be delighted to, Gillian Martin, of course. Uh, a number of members referred to employment and education, as did Mr. Fraser's third report. In particular, Mr. Fraser mentioned the need for better recognition of qualifications and skills, and a number of members have picked this up throughout the afternoon, that uh, these people we're talking about have skill sets, they have disciplines, they have experiences that are of huge value if we can only recognize them and tap into them. And so we certainly look forward to supporting the government's motion. And I do also commend the Scottish Conservative Amendment, which seeks to explicitly recognise the importance of the many veterans' charities. But before I do that, I want to flag a point that was made by the Cabinet Secretary in, in his opening remarks about those transferable skills and being a valuable resource. And actually, Mark Griffin made the point at the outset, and the, the Royal British Legion uh, make the point that there's a, a risk of a, a misconception that as the, the Legion talk about that veterans are, quote, mad, bad, and sad. Their statistics suggest that this is not the case and that statistically veterans mm -hmm. are in many respects no different from the population uh, at large. And Mr. Fraser talks in the transition in Scotland about that this may be the time for a more fundamental shift in the way we perceive and treat veterans in Scotland, reversing a narrative that tends to view them through the prism of need and obligation and encouraging society to recognize them far more for their strengths and their qualities. But some do need more help. Uh, in Scotland, Maurice Corrie pointed out that we have at least 320 armed forces charities in operation, providing a, a wide variety of different services for the veterans community. One of those, like Wings for Warriors, works with wounded and medically discharged ex-service personnel to provide them with the skills to achieve an exciting, rewarding and sustainable future as professional pilots. They have big plans to create the world's first disabled veterans flying school, hopefully based on the eastern perimeter of Aberdeen, 
Airport. They've recently been awarded two small grants from Aberdeen Council, but of course that council remains the lowest funded in the country, and I would hope the Cabinet Secretary will familiarise himself with Wings for Warriors and respond positively to approaches from them in the future. Another successful and incredibly significant charity in the North East is Horseback UK. It was co-founded by ex-Marine Jock Hutchison, uh, and it uses horsemanship to inspire recovery, to regain self-esteem, and provide a sense of purpose and community to the wounded, the injured, and the sick of the military community. Graham Day spoke very movingly of his granddad, who even with a dram in him, found it difficult to talk of the horrors that he'd witnessed. And that's what Horseback UK is mainly about. Because learning to work with a horse is one of the most intricate and challenging things that anyone can do. And this charity can demonstrate, it has empirical data that shows that both mentally and physically there are benefits that result. Now I went to see in the summer to see for myself how it worked and the bond between horse and man. Going into the yard, Jock brought out this huge animal, it was the size of a horse, demonstrating what not to do. Yeah, that was the joke, it was a horse. So, glad to see you're listening. Demonstrating what not to do, he instructed the horse to move, but it refused. Then he stood respectfully next to the beast. He spoke to it, and I could see him gently gesticulating as to what he would like the horse to do. Then he stood still next to the horse. The horse was still. He looked in the horse's eye and smiled, and then raised his hand. And then he will tell you exactly what happened when he comes to my members' debate and reception, which is on the 7th of February. <laughs> And I look forward to seeing you all there. <laughs> now, finally, Maurice Corrie alluded to my motion and debate from last February, where I noted that almost two-thirds of members of the forces community had personally come across people wearing medals or insignia awarded to someone else. He also noted that the Awards for Valour Protection Bill, which would have made the false wearing of medals with the intention to deceive a criminal offence throughout the United Kingdom, had fallen due to the general election. Now, I would ask that the Cabinet Secretary consider in his closing and perhaps uh, give a detailed response as to where he sees the next stage uh, in this, given that in my debate there was cross-party support for the Awards for Valour Bill and if there's anything we should be doing. Presiding officer, we've had a consensual and productive debate this afternoon. It's encouraging to see such cross-party consensus on this significant subject. I do urge us to send a signal from this chamber. We hold the work of veterans and their families and their children their commitment and devotion in the highest possible regard and pledge to forever honour and support our servicemen and women, their families and our veterans. Thank you. Uh, I call Keith Brown to close this debate. Uh, around 11 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, thank the members of the debate for what has been, I think, an interesting and stimulating debate on what uh, by consensus seems to be regarded as an extremely important issue, which is obviously of close personal interest to many of us here today. I think we've had quite a number of very thoughtful contributions, and of course, we've also had Mike Rumbles. <laughs> I think it's also true to say that um, some of the contributions, I'll try and respond to them if I can, including to Mike Rumbles. I know I want to come back uh, on, on the issues that he raised. But first of all, to say in relation to a point raised by Bruce Crawford, he mentioned a number of ex-personnel who have ended up in prison. Uh, I had the chance for the first time this year to go to uh, my local prison to go to the Remembrance Service there and I encourage members uh, if they get the chance as well as going to the other Remembrance Services that they go to if they can to go to one in their local prison if there is one available to do so. Uh, that one that is one way uh, where we can actually make contact as I did with a number of people who are ex-service personnel uh, but who currently are in prison. It's one way of uh, joining in the respect of that day and making some connections. Uh, I should also say that um, we all have a role to play, not least through remembrance, but also uh, more strategically as uh, MSPs in our constituencies to ensure that those in the armed forces uh, community who require assistance receive the best advice and services available. And I think just the fact that we uh, show our awareness uh, and empathy with the roles that they play is very important. So I'm very pleased about the, so far, um, early stage armed forces uh, visiting programme. 
And just to make it very clear to all members that there's a visit next week to my old unit 4-5 commando, uh, where we'll see all the things which Marines get up to. So to say to anybody, I'm trying to see if I can clear my diary, to come along and I'm sure you'll have a very uh, enjoyable day in Condor and our broth. Uh, today was the first opportunity I've had to update Parliament on our work to take forward the Veteran Commissioner's recommendations. I have never, I have to say in these debates, uh, declared an interest, perhaps I should have done, but I should also perhaps have declared an interest when appointing uh, Eric Fraser, because like me, he was in the Royal Navy, although I was in the best part, of course, of the Royal Navy being in the Royal Marines. <laughs> Uh, and I would want to agree with those members that pointed out the quality of the work that Eric Fraser has taken forward. I think it's been a tremendous innovation. We've been very lucky to have Eric Fraser as our first Veterans Commissioner. And going forward, I think the best uh, testament to Eric's work will be to maintain the momentum and transparency on some of the important issues which he's raised. And I commit to look to find time for a, a debate like this uh, annually. The Scottish Government and our partners have taken forward a wide portfolio of work aimed at better supporting our armed forces community. But of course, and to go back to a point that was made by a number of members, there is a great deal more that we can do. I think there were some very uh, interesting contributions that we had. I noticed that uh, Liam Kerr referred to three veterans, myself, uh, Maurice Corey, uh, and Edward Mountain, and then talked about mad, bad, and sad. I don't know which of us is which, <laughs> uh, but I'm very grateful uh, to Liam Kerr for pointing that out. Um, Finley Carson said that he'd been to the most beautiful constituency in Scotland and managed to Dumbly and say, you can come back any time you like, uh, you'd be more than welcome. I think Bruce Crawford's contribution, especially the recollection, as with a number of other members of, uh, members of their family, some now going back into the mists of time, to be honest, is, uh, is always very welcome to hear that. And it does, as Daniel Johnson uh, reminded us, help us maintain that connection, which I think is very important. And again, two uh, very good speeches from Mark Griffin, both in opening and in closing, specifically in remembering uh, the sacrifice given by many uh, veterans. Also, some of the contributions from Tom Arthur and Christine Graham, Christine Graham in terms of Women's uh, Enterprise Scotland. And I think that the important point to me is, I mean, I heard what Christine Graham had to say, but I think she will agree with me that it's only when you see the change which takes place in those mainly women, uh, of course, for women's enterprise that are involved in this to change because of that isolation, sometimes alienation, uh, and also because of the extent to which you can be diminished by uh, not being um, the, per the primary person, if you like, in support of somebody else. It has had a, a, an astonishing effect on the women concerned who uh, are, are supporting uh, male partners, by and large, the ones that I saw in the armed forces. I, I will do, yes. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for that, Sorry. officer. Um, very interesting point about Christine Graham's uh, Women at Enterprise um, in Scotland. There is also Recruits for Spouses, which you know is currently running. And I'm wondering if there might be, Cabinet Secretary, some get-together of those two organisations, because they are trying to achieve the same aims, because we've got talented uh, partners, wives, who are coming up to Scotland, and particularly now, as we see, into Pass Lane, and I attended last, the other day the opening of the Scottish Submarine Centre, which is fantastic, and the lots of people who are there who could offer skills and we've already taken one of those up who actually did the final design of the digital um, uh, motifs and everything for the summary centre so I do commend that. Join Keith together. Brown. Uh, happy to look into that and I think as you say there is uh, a synergy there between what's happening there and what's happening with Women Enterprise Scotland and also again to Liam Kerr's points about the uh, two um, third sector organisations he mentioned. I've been to Horsebike UK, the Scottish Government is supporting them to the extent of seven and a half thousand pounds. I think in fact Jock um, as well as being an extra marine is from Dollar as well where I come from so they had a very good visit uh, to there. Um, just to mention one or two other points that were raised, I think that the one thing that I took positively, uh, if it was possible to do so from Mike Rumble's discussion, which I think belonged to a different debate entirely, but um, he did mention the fact that we're not just here to slap each other in the back and be consensual. We should not be um, unwilling to embrace uh, controversy or sometimes difficult issues, and that's the only way we can continually to improve services. Uh, just uh, in relation to that, I would say that um, and I don't want to be controversial for the sake of it, but I think this is quite important to say, given the comments of members about remembrance. The, the badge I'm wearing today commemorates the uh, First World War, and of course we're now into the year when we'll come to the 100th anniversary <laughs> of uh, Armistice Day, and very important to remember that. The point I would make is that if you think about what the people in that particular conflict went through, so by and large, in trenches which are soaked, which are freezing, which are rat-infested, where you often have the, the remains of your colleagues as the, uh, what you're walking on in that trench, uh, uh, trench where you're constantly bombarded. We've heard some comments about uh, shell shock, as it was called then, PTSD since then. 
I could only imagine somebody that experienced that, looking at the debate that we had about what kind of jacket somebody wore to remembrance service this week and just being absolutely appalled. Uh, that is a bizarre uh, discussion to have and it bears no respect at all for the people who went through that experience. As I say, generally very um, positive contributions. Uh, the government, for our part, of course, are willing to listen both to Eric Fraser and to other members about where we might be able to improve things. We have taken forward quite a number of issues. Um, I think some of the points that Daniel Johnson made about whether it's housing, whether it's health, or whether it's education, plans for people leaving the armed forces should start on the day they join the armed forces. I've made this point repeatedly to the UK government. The MOD could do something at the very start. Everybody could immediately subscribe to get housing points from the day they joined the armed forces. We could get right away the health records. We could oblige people to tell the MOD which GP they're going to go to as soon as they leave uh, the armed forces. There's a lot we can do if we can get in at that stage. Um, and we've tried to convince the UK government of that and will continue to do so. And it's those three things which are the three pillars. People have mentioned how important getting a job is, extremely important, but it also must rely on having a decent house uh, and also uh, in terms of health, having access to the right uh, services. If you can get those three things right, then even if we just want to be selfish about it, we can save the state an awful lot of money just by getting it right. But more importantly, we can provide a proper future uh, for our veterans. Uh, I've also mentioned where we will bring forward guidance and promote best practice in housing. We've got an obligation here as well, and that we'll continue to work through the Scottish Service Children's Strategy Group to support the educational needs of service children in Scotland. Somebody mentioned the peripatetic, I think it was Christine Graham, mentioned the peripatetic nature of the armed forces. I have to say that continually moving units around the country uh, there's one unit which is about to go through its fourth educational system. That can't be good uh, for the children. So I would say that in future moves and revisions of the defence configuration in the UK, let's think about those members of the armed forces who have families uh, and children, because it's very important. And it also, going back to the point I made before, how expensive it can be when we get it wrong, if we want to avoid that expense and provide the best possible experience for children uh, in the armed forces, then we should get that right. And we should take them into account when we're moving people around the chessboard. It will also take our forward our engagement on employability through the Veterans Employability Strategic Group. I would say in response to the particular point uh, that uh, Maurice Corey raised about the group, um, I think uh, having had a long chat uh, with Mark Bibby, I'm really impressed by the work, that's to the extent I didn't expect to be, by the work that's been taken forward in relation to that. And it would repay him if he gets a chance, if he's not done so already, to sit down with Mark and discuss that further. Some really, um, uh, really important issues coming out of that, how we best get uh, veterans, not just into work, but into, in, into the type of work that their qualifications, their experience, and their abilities deserve them to get into. So I think that's very important. Uh, that group will continue to look at the uh, commissioner's recommendations as their work progresses including considering areas such as work placements, accreditation and mapping of military skills into the civilian workplace. They've also set out a plan for additional qualitative research to identify barriers which will help to shape thinking on the feasibility of a pilot approach. The other point that was made about articulation of um, uh, skills, uh, experience and qualifications that have been gained during uh, Armed Forces Service. We have done some work on that through SDS, but certainly recently being in Canada, talking to their Deputy Minister for Veterans, they seem to have a much uh, more comprehensive approach. Of course, they have both sides of the equation, both in Armed Forces and Veterans, but I think there's a lot we can learn from that to make it as easy as possible. And I agree with the fundamental point that some of the skills that we have in our veterans are so valuable, especially just now, uh, in terms both of Brexit and, of course, the pressure on the labour market, that we have to make sure we make the most of them. And we have to let the veterans themselves know that they have these abilities. And what they have done in the armed forces <coughs> is really important to civilian employers. Uh, so for uh, many of us, I think, we've concentrated in this debate quite rightly on the protections that we're afforded by uh, those that have uh, served and the way that they have defended our freedom and ways of life. And it's right that we continue to make Scotland a society which recognises the full value of our armed forces community and aspires to be the destination of choice, a very important point, the destination of choice for personnel leaving the armed forces, wherever they are in the UK or elsewhere, we should make Scotland the place they want to come uh, to spend the rest of their lives after having served. So in that um, vein, uh, President Officer, I'd like to move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of business motions 8863 and 8864 on timetables for two bills at stage two.
I would ask any member who wishes to speak against either motion to press their request to speak. But now I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions on block. Move together. Thank you very much. No member is asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, I propose to put a single question. If anyone objects, please say so now. Good. No member has objected. The question is that motions 8863 and 8864 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motion 8865 on approval of an SSI, motion 8866 on designation of a Leeds committee, and motion 8961 on committee membership. Moved on block. Thank you very much. Now, I am minded to take a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. Could I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move such a motion? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that we move decision time to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So there are four questions today. The first question is that motion 8649, in the name of Tom Arthur, on Powell and Chaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion eight, sorry, is that amendment 8855.1 in the name of Maurice Corry, who seeks to amend motion 8855 in the name of Keith Brown on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 8855 in the name of Keith Brown as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And a final question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Any object to a question on all three? No, that's good. The question is that motions 8865, 8866 and 8961 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. I now close this meeting. <laughs>